Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June 30th, 2020 regular town board meeting. Now we're gonna call the meeting to order. Will a clerk please call the roll? Councilman Delorado. Present. Councilwoman Jaquith. Here. Councilwoman McGraw. Here. Councilman McPartland. Here. Supervisor Syed. Here. I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America. America. And to the, and to the Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We're going to move on to approval of the minutes. First, we have the minutes of the May 26, 2020 regular town board meeting. Do I have a second for approval on those minutes? I'll second. Thank you. Are there, are there any changes or additions to those minutes? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approving these minutes, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And those minutes are approved. Next, we have the minutes of the June 15, 2020 emergency special meeting. Do I have a second to approve those minutes? Second. Thank you. Are there any changes or additions to those minutes? Okay, with no changes or additions, all those in favor of approving the minutes, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And those minutes are approved. And lastly, we have the minutes of the June 17, 2020 emergency special meeting. Do I have a second to approve those minutes? Second. Thank you. Are there any changes or additions to those minutes? No changes or additions. All those in favor of approving those minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And those minutes are approved. And now we have a presentation to be made by Chief Dan McManus. He would like to address the fireworks noise complaints. So Chief, I will yield the floor to you. Okay, thank you, Supervisor. Good evening. Uh, so I've been asked to speak on the current fireworks issue that has been annoying uh, the residents of the town, not only here, uh, but in fact, in all of Schenectady and other counties around the, the state. Um, obviously fireworks are not only an annoyance, but they can have um, a significant impact on the mental welfare of those who have suffered from trauma, uh, people who have behavioral or mental health issues, and obviously the noise can also greatly affect the health of our pets. Uh, several years ago, New York State legalized the sale and possession uh, of certain fireworks. They were defined as uh, sparkling devices, ground-based or handheld uh, devices that produced a shower of sparks and smoke and that kind of thing. Uh, they were defined as cone fountains, uh, wooden sparklers or dipsticks, party poppers and snappers. So those are the things that you see um, in different areas where they have pop-up tents or some retailers that'll have those type of fireworks. Uh, currently all but eight counties in the state allow for the sale of those type of fireworks and they have a schedule from uh, June 1st to July 5th, and then again from December 26th to January 2nd for larger retailers. The pop-up tents um, go from June 20th to July 5th and December 26th to Ju uh, January 2nd. But all other types of fireworks, including firecrackers, bottle rockets, Roman candles, spinners, any aerial devices, <laughs> they all remain illegal uh, across the state. So um, it's my understanding that Albany County now joins Schenectady County in banning all fireworks in an effort to curb uh, the behavior that you know we're experiencing the complaints on. I uh, reached out to the um, communication center for the county. Uh, since June 1st, uh, Schenectady County has received more than a thousand calls for fireworks complaints. Of those, uh, just under 90% of the complaints came from the city of Schenectady. 10% uh, came from the residents of Rotterdam. Niskayuna uh, had 1% of the calls as well as Scotia. Uh, one half of 1% uh, 
came from the town of Glenville and one half of 1% were called into either the state police or the sheriff for outlying areas. <clears throat> um, our police department filed 18 complaints in that time period uh, and investigated those. In the vast majority of those cases, we found that uh, most of the fireworks were in fact coming from uh, the city of Schenectady. Um, we did have a couple of emails on specific addresses, but when we responded, uh, we didn't uh, identify any fireworks in the area um, and all was quiet in that. Um, it's a difficult situation. Uh, we do our best to respond to all the complaints that we receive and try to identify uh, where in maybe neighboring neighborhoods for uh, the town, which are in Schenectady, if we can help uh, Schenectady identify those spots, we do. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, the town may want to look to talk to state legislators or the governor it may be in an effort to repeal the law that even allows certain amount of fireworks um, to make a complete ban again. I think a, a lot of times what has happened is with the sale of these certain fireworks, uh, people don't see uh, a big deal with having some of the bigger ones, some of the aerial ones, ones that are making um, a report or a loud noise, um, and sometimes even commercial style fireworks that are purchased in different states, um, down south, Pennsylvania uh, has them available as well. So uh, I think with the smaller ones, it's, it's a little more uh, difficult uh, to enforce. We get complaints that might not be for illegal fireworks, but again, I think a lot of people, particularly around the 4th of July, um, step over that uh, legal threshold into some other fireworks that are maybe available through other means. Uh, I don't have anything uh, beyond that, but if anybody has any questions, I could answer. Chief, thank Chief, you thank very you. much for doing this, uh, accommodating my request. I, as always, you're just right there, whatever we ask. Um, and this is one that's a tricky one. I mean, and you pointed it out. Um, there's not, you know, there's not a lot of data because I don't, I don't think that people know who to call. So what are you recommending if folks hear this? Should they call the non-emergency number? Should they call the call, you know, the call center in Rotterdam? I, I mean, I, I think people are reluctant to call 911 about it unless they are in imminent danger because they don't want to be a nuisance, but they, I think they want to be heard. Absolutely. Uh, and they can always call the non-emergency number down at the UCC, particularly as, uh, as you say, if it's not an emergency where uh, it's in close proximity. Yeah, to they're them. throwing them at their house and they're getting, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we do uh, go out, obviously, Schenectady is overwhelmed with these types of calls um, and they do uh, their best to investigate those. But if people uh, do hear fireworks and they can give the dispatcher some kind of indication, maybe the direction in which they're hearing them. Um, obviously at night when things are quiet, uh, sound travels, you know, forever. And, uh, um, you know, it might sound like it's a lot closer than it is. Uh, but if you are aware of specific addresses that are, you know, utilizing fireworks, by all means, uh, call the dispatch center. And I can um, tell you the number, it's uh, 630 but it's posted on all the websites and, and that kind of thing, so. I, and we're up against it. I mean, I was in Schenectady uh, just today and there's a billboard for a fireworks sales place in New Hampshire, right there in the city of Schenectady. So, I mean, we certainly have our work cut out for us. Um, you know, the town board members are hearing from residents on a whole host of issues right now, but I have to say probably two to one, I get that I'm hearing from people about the fireworks. They just don't know what to do. So thank you very much for just, you know, that you know what's going on, you're hearing it, your guys are on it, they know what's going on, we know where it's coming from. We might not know the exact addresses, but you know, you have. I, I don't want folks to think that we can't hear it or we're, you know, or you can't hear it. You live around the corner from me. I know you're hearing it too. So I, Penny is probably just as anxious as Mo is about all of these things. So absolutely. And uh, as I said, the, the, the ones that produce a loud uh, noise and that type of thing, they are illegal. 
and people can be cited for possessing those um, as well. So I want to be careful. Great. Thank you very much, Chief. I really appreciate this. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, we're going to move into privilege of the floor. We have many, many letters to get through. So I'm going to try to get through as many as possible without taking a break. Hopefully I can get through all of them, um, but we will take a brief break either during privilege of the floor or after before we um, head into committee reports and the rest of the business for the evening, only because we do have just so many letters to get through. Um how many letters, supervisor? Uh, quite a few. If I had to guess, over 30. Wow. Yeah. Um, supervisor, we yeah. are joined by um, Colleen Abercrombie Castle, who we're doing a ceremonial resolution for. And I, yes. I wonder, I don't want to keep her through all those letters. Perhaps we could entertain that, if not now, soon, so that uh, we could recognize her contributions and she yeah. can get on with her evening. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a great suggestion. I think we should take up and that's the first resolution 2021-55. So we will move to that resolution and we will go back to privilege of the floor. So thank you. Time. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for the suggestion. We're going to move on to resolution 2020-155 sponsored by Councilwoman Jaquist. Will the clerk please read? A ceremonial resolution thanking Master Gardener Colleen Abercrombie Castle for enhancing Lions Park with her contribution of public gardens. Thank you. Do I, I will second. I didn't hear the second. I will second. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, so, yeah, so th thank you. We want to thank Master Gardener uh, uh, Colleen Abercrombie Castle for her beautification efforts at Lions Park, certainly in a time when our community is reminded of the value of outdoor spaces. Ms. Abercrombie Castle took it upon herself to create a beautiful public garden, making our outdoor spaces more pleasing during a time when we need to be reminded of that beauty and the beauty of our world and inspiring others uh, with her selfless contribution. So thank you for your gift to all Neskina residents, Colleen, and for everyone else visiting Lions Park. We are truly appreciative and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I didn't expect to be recognized and I very much appreciate it. Again, we're, we're grateful and uh, we will mail you a copy of the ceremonial resolution to your home. I know you sent me your address, I forwarded that. And um, again, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you're you. welcome to stay with us if you'd like, but uh, you're welcome to leave also. I'm meeting you up for a little while. It sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you again. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, Colleen. So we have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll on the ceremonial resolution? Councilman Delarada. Yes. Councilwoman Jaquith. Yes. Councilwoman McGraw. Aye, with great pleasure. Thank you, Colleen. Councilman McPartland. Aye, thank you very much, Colleen. Supervisor Syed. Yes. Five ayes. And this resolution passes. And we thank you so much for your contribution to our park, Colleen. I'm sure that so many of our residents are going to enjoy this all summer long and in the years to come. So we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. So we will go back to privilege of the floor. And I'm going to begin with our first letter. It was to be read during our last special town board meeting. Um, I did miss it, but I am going to read it now tonight. And this is from John Lamellen of 1106 Glen Meadow Court in Niskayuna. He writes, Dear members of the Niskayuna Town Board, like many of you, I was appalled to learn that a prominent town employee thought that dressing up as blackface was okay. The fact that his employee was also the town's, the fact that this employee was also the town's director of human resources makes this offense even more serious and demands an independent investigation into the facts. I was also concerned after reading Councilman Delorado's response to the incident, which is published in the Schenectady Gazette on June 20th. Councilman Delorado is quoted in the article as saying, 
my wife, Michelle, viewed this photo with another town employee at Town Hall approximately two years ago. This statement presents a whole host of questions, including who is this other town employee who shared this offensive photo with them? Did either of these employees raise a concern about the photo to anyone? Are there any other town employees who were involved? Have there been other racist photos that have been shared with town employees? Have there been other racist incidents involving town employees? What are the implications of having the town's director of human resources involved in this incident? As our elected representatives, we deserve to know where each of you stand regarding an independent investigation into the entire incident. I will be watching the town board special meeting online and welcome your responses. I'm submitting a copy of this letter to the town clerk for inclusion in the town board special meeting minutes. Thank you, John Lamellon. And that concludes that public comment. Next public comment was submitted by Mark Rogerson. Mark writes, I'm writing to support the proposed task force on racial equity and justice proposed by town board member Rosemary Perez Jaquith. I feel strongly that we need a task force led by people of color, specifically African American members of our community to look at policies, procedures and practices through the lens of equality. Now is the time to take the action to remedy systemic racism. My heart is broken by the many stories of pain, suffering, and discrimination, and not just from recent events. This is my home, and I want to know that my town is listening, learning, and making changes. Justice delayed is justice denied. Do not delay. It should be easy to do the right thing and vote on June 30th to form the task force and empower it to get to work immediately. That concludes that uh, privilege of the floor letter. Next letter was submitted by Diane O'Donnell and Maria Freund. They write, please read the following at the June 30th, 2020 regular town board meeting and include this in the minutes for that meeting. Dear Supervisor Syed and members of the Niskuna Town Board, a photograph of Paul Sebesta in a Halloween costume surfaced earlier this month. It is our understanding that this is a 2014 photograph that at one time appeared on Paul's Facebook page. We learned that Paul removed the photograph when he realized that it may be hurtful to some. A screenshot of the Facebook post was taken by someone and apparently has been retained for years. We have heard that the photo was viewed at Town Hall years ago without action. For some reason, the photograph was provided to Progressive Schenectady, who in turn provided it to the town supervisor and board members. Social media posts appeared, the press was contacted, and a frenzy began. The town board met and Paul Swift was swiftly suspended without pay pending investigation. Paul then decided to follow through on his original plan for this spring and retired. We acknowledge that putting on blackface is offensive. In context, it is racist and demeaning. We also acknowledge that Paul's choice of a Halloween costume could spark sensitivity and be considered a poor judgment. But poor judgment and being insensitive is out of character for Paul. We believe it was never Paul's intention to be offensive, racist, or demeaning. There is no evidence that Paul ever behaved in this way, and we feel to ins we, we feel to insinuate that he has is unjust and unfair. We all need to recognize mistakes can be made and hurt caused unintentionally. We all need to find compassion and look for understanding before we pass judgment. We all need to be forgiving. We have known Paul for many years professionally and personally. It was a pleasure to work with Paul in his role as town comptroller during our terms as NIST Unit Town board members. Serving the town for over 30 years with multiple town supervisors and boards is a testament to Paul's dedication, knowledge, insight, and skills. Paul worked countless hours beyond a typical daily schedule to provide sound recommendations and decisions for purchasing and contracts to produce accurate and timely financial reporting and to collaborate and coordinate town budgets. Paul put off his planned April retirement to ensure that the town was well positioned for the, ch for the challenge of the New York State on pause due to the pandemic and to be available to train his replacement to transition into his role. Paul committed himself to our town and to his position. Beyond his professional skills, we know Paul to be a kind, caring, and thoughtful individual. He is a man of ethics and integrity. We have seen him demonstrate all of this over the years as a colleague, son, father, and friend. We would like to recognize Paul Sebesta's accomplishments and 32 years of service to our town. Paul deserves our thanks and gratitude. We wish Paul a healthy and happy retirement. And that concludes that privilege of the floor letter. Next letter is submitted from 
Danielle Polishuk. Danielle writes, dear supervisor, members of the board, my name is Danielle Polishuk. My address is 305 St. Anne Drive. I request that my statement be read during privilege of the floor at the June 30th town board meeting. I give permission to use my name. Any further is dear town planning board. My family and I are joining our neighbors and voicing our strong opposition to the Windsor Drive cut through as part of the Celts Farm project. The singular focus of the planning board on the concept of connectivity at the expense of increased traffic, changing the local character of our neighborhood and decreased safety of the Windsor Drive is not appropriate to my family, my neighbors and myself. We implore the town board to help us keep our neighborhood safe, environmentally friendly and attractive to the current families living on Windsor Drive, as well as to the future generations of home buyers. That concludes that letter. Next letter is submitted by Ali and Helena Mirza of 22 Briar Ridge. They write, Dear Supervisor Syed and town board members, as a resident of Nisina for over 20 years, we would like to convey our opposition to the Windsor Drive connection to River Road based on the information you will have re received previously tonight. We are in favor of the multi-use path being extended to River Road, but adamantly oppose a crash gate on River Road as indicated in the proposal slash recommendation from the planning board. That concludes that letter. Next letter is submitted by Farzana Syed and Zayn Syed of 4040 Windsor Drive. And they write, we are against this plan of extension of Windsor Drive slash connecting Windsor Drive to River Road and our reasons include, number one, safety concerns. Windsor Drive has speed limits of 30 miles per hour, but as we all know that the speed limit is not watched by all drivers. And if the connection is made to River Road, this is going to affect the safety of our neighborhood. It is a residential neighborhood with young families thus making a connection will put safety of residents at risk because of high traffic and speeding. Number two, property value. Connection will result in decreased property value due to the above mentioned reasons. And number three, loss of peacefulness of neighborhood due to increased traffic and noise. And this will also affect our ability to safely cross roads with kids and pets to walk. That concludes that letter. Next letter we have is submitted by Faye Falvo Rispoli. And Faye writes, Supervisor Syed and town board members, Murphy McGraw, Delorada, Perez Jaquith, and McPartland. My name is Faye Falvo Rispoli and I live at 2509 Angelina Drive. I'm writing to you to express my concerns regarding the proposed connection of Windsor Drive to River Road. I'm a real estate agent with Remax Solutions. I've been involved in the local real estate business for more than 40 years, and I've been personally involved in hundreds of purchases and sales in the town of Nisuna during my career. I know the Nisuna real estate market very well. It is my professional opinion that the value of homes on Windsor Drive will be negatively impacted by this roadway connection. I've read the projections that the connection will, will result, result in an additional thousand vehicle trips per day on Windsor Drive to be added to the current total of approximately 3,650 vehicle trips per day. Such a significant change in traffic volume will discourage prospective buyers, especially families with young children from wanting to live on Windsor. This more constant traffic flow will create safety issues, noise, and it will damage the neighborhood character of Windsor Drive. I know that I would strongly encourage all prospective clients to perform their due diligence related to safety and traffic volume prior to purchasing a home on Windsor Drive. It is my opinion with more than 40 years of real estate experience that there would be a 10% 10, 10 to 15% loss in property value because of this connection. That is substantial. I would therefore request that the roadway connection be denied. And that concludes that privilege of the floor letter. Next letter is submitted by Bill and Linda Ward of 4028 Windsor Drive. They write, Dear Supervisor Syed and members of the town board, we are waiting, we are writing to express our opposition to the proposed extension of Windsor Drive and making it a cut through road to River Road. We have lived on Windsor Drive for 27 years. During that time, we have noted an increase in both traffic and vehicle speed that has affected both safety and quality of life. 
As stated in the comprehensive plan of 2013, quote, as road traffic and speeds increase, the road becomes a barrier, safety becomes a problem, and the sense of neighborhood is lost, unquote. If there is an increase of 950 cars per day in Windsor Drive as a result of this extension, as noted in the recent traffic study results, all these become significant issues. We ask that you vote in favor of a multi-use path only with no vehicular access. That concludes that letter. Next letter is submitted by Michelle Austerlich of 76 Pheasant Ridge. Michelle writes, Dear Supervisor Syed and Town Council Members Murphy McGraw, McPartland, Delorada, and Perez Jaycliffe, I write today about a matter that will come before you in the near future. I write in opposition to a roadway connecting Windsor Drive to River Road through the Celts Farm development. Instead, I ask that the board connect the neighborhoods with an extension of the multi-use bike path. Please add my voice to the many residents who have spoken against a connecting roadway through Celts Farm because of the extraordinarily large traffic it is projected to bring to this neighborhood. The roadway would divert over 950 cars daily towards the newly proposed intersection with River Road and unnecessarily. It would be better to continue directing traffic down Van Antwerp to the large GA traffic circle that can safely handle this traffic. There is little to be gained by creating a roadway to Celts Farm and much to be lost. I appreciate your consideration and all the time you have spent listening to residents about this matter. And that concludes that letter. Our next letter is submitted by Javed and Roxana Safi. And they write, my name is Javed Safi. My wife, Roxana, and I reside at 4033 Windsor Drive. We are writing to you along with other residents of Windsor Drive to support our opposition to the proposed cut through the planning board has submitted for Windsor Drive to River Road. This would severely compromise the safety of the street by the increase in traffic, speed, and pollution. In addition, after reviewing the reports of the various town committees that have been looked at that have looked at this cut through, we also feel that the majority of the data collected has suggested that the risks of making this cut through outweigh any perceived benefits. It seems that the mantra to complete a proposal made by the town plan years ago is just being pushed through despite the evidence which shows more harm. Along with our other neighbors, we, suppo we support the completion of the hike bike path to River Road with no road connection, no crash gate as proposed by the planning board. Thank you for the privilege of the floor. And that concludes that letter. Next letter is submitted by Susan Paulsonelli, who lives on Oakmont Street. And Susan writes, I write to you today regarding three resolutions on the agenda. First, I thank the town board in advance for acting in the interest of all employees by authorizing an investigation by outside legal counsel into a racist incident by a town employee. Particularly because this employee was the director of human resources, it seems inescapable that a comprehensive and thorough investigation is necessary to remedy harm and restore confidence in, in the town's process for protecting employees from racist acts, harassment, and discrimination. I anticipate that given the gravity of the situation, all members of the town board will vote yes on the resolution to engage Tina Shaketi Esquire. Second, I'm happy to see that the members of the town board signed on as sponsors of town board member Perez Jacob's resolution for a task force on racial equity and justice. This is a necessary step for the town to take and I applaud the town board members for their leadership. And third, while I support the above actions, I don't support the resolution designating Paul Briggs, the town attorney, as manager of human resources. The costly retainer for outside legal counsel discussed above illustrates the danger inherent in mismanaged HR complaints. They are hugely expensive and can cause extensive damage to the victims of misconduct in the workplace. Human resources issues must be addressed by professionals with relevant expertise. Mr. Sebesta, the prior director of human resources who retired following a racist incident did not have HR credentials. And as I understand it, Mr. Briggs doesn't either. According to AVO, a legal search service, Mr. Briggs has a background in civil litigation, auto accidents, commercial and wrongful death litigation. So while he fulfills many functions for the town, he clearly is not the experienced human, human resources professional required for store employee confidence following this most recent and harmful incident. The town should not double down on past mistakes with this appointment. 
I therefore, I therefore urge the resolution appointing Paul Briggs be withdrawn and a new resolution be offered engaging the services of a human resources, human resources consulting firm or other professional with specific expertise in managing human resources. Thank you for your service and stewardship. And that concludes that letter. My next letter. is submitted by Michael Palmiotto of 39 Oakmont Street. And Michael writes, kudos to NIST Unit Town Councilman John Delarada. His comments critical of the other members of the board regarding the handling of this FESTA case show an intelligent understanding of racism and what racism actually is. He addresses the question of Sebesta's bigotry with the statement, quote, one incident does not a bigot mate, unquote. Delarada is correct. There should be a pattern of behavior that appears racially derogatory and demeaning. I might add that there must also be present an intent to insult a race or class of people. Delarada, being a lawyer, knows that there is no evidence that Sebesta intended to degrade African Americans. This has occurred to many people, e.g. Kate Smith, whose God Bless America rendition was banned by the Yankee Baseball Organization because she recorded two songs as an aspiring young singer which are now deemed racist, hence an American tradition gone. Sebesta's life will probably never be the same thanks to a blundering town board which collectively showed ignorance and its own bias. We in Niskuna are fortunate to have at least one intelligent board member who also has compassion and common sense respectfully submitted Michael Palmiotto. That concludes that letter. Our next letter is submitted by Eric Engelmeyer. And Eric writes, I am writing this email in support of the proposed task force for racial equity and justice proposed by town board member, Rosemary, Rosemary Perez Jaquith. I feel strongly that we need a task force led by people of color, specifically African-American members of our community to examine the policies, procedures, and practices through the lens of equality and fairness for all of Ms. Hina's residents. Now is the time to take this action to remedy systemic racism. I am saddened and dismayed by the stories of pain, suffering, and discrimination. This is my home, and I want to know that my town is listening, learning, and making changes. Justice delayed is justice denied. Do not delay. It should be easy to do the right thing and vote on June 30th to form the task force and empower it to get to work immediately. That concludes that letter. Next letter. is submitted by Roger and Holly Griffin of 3009 Troy Road. And they write, dear board members, we have known Paul Sebesta for over 20 years. He has always been a caring, kind, and conscientious person, a true professional and an upstanding citizen of our community. He is committed to his family and to his career. The town comptroller's job is demanding. It requires accountability, long hours of hard work, attention to detail, and a professional attitude. Paul embodies all of these qualities and more. In the years we have known him, he also managed to single-handedly care for his elderly and infirm parents, co-parent two teenage daughters, and invest inordinate amounts of time into construction projects. He's a great guy, and we wish we could accomplish even half of what he has. How could this town and, and its elected officials overlook the many, many years of his dedicated and honest service due to a party photo snapped over six years ago? Why has so much time passed? Why did someone wait to reveal this until the volatile social climate could compromise his safety and the safety of his family? Our ancestors settled this town in the 1600s. Their foresight created a wonderful place to live and raise children. Unfortunately, we do not predict the same future here. We see petty politicians running the hamlet in a fierce rush to make names for themselves. We see them hurting some of the best people the town has ever produced. This region is great due largely in part to its residents. A small lapse in judgment over half a decade ago has interrupted the stellar selfless career of a lifelong Nisuna resident. Paul Sebesta dedicated his life to public service. You will never find another individual as honest, hardworking, and affable as Paul. His removal is grossly unfair to him and to our town. 
How many times must someone apologize for an age old indiscretion? You should not have rushed to judgment based on current events. We cannot condone what he did. However, the manner in which it, the manner in which it was brought to light and handled by this administration would be devastating to anyone who had dedicated so much of his life to improving our town. That concludes that letter. Our next letter is submitted by Jack Haggerty of 1060 Nicholas Ave and Jack Wrights. Dear Supervisor Side and town board members, I am writing to support the proposed task force for racial equity and justice proposed by town board member Rosemary Perez Jacob. That concludes that public comment. And our next public comment is This was submitted by Reverend Bernardo Martinez. This letter is in support for Paul Sebesta. My name is Reverend Bernardo Martinez, the co-founder of a coalition of clergy, community advocates, and local leaders that are fighting for equal education in Schenectady schools. After seeing the recent news article about Paul and the blackface allegations, I, along with my wife, felt urged to speak up and to share our experience with Paul, especially from the point of view of a minority family living in Escuna. In the past four years, my family and I have had Paul as our neighbor and landlord. Throughout these years, we have had many conversations and interactions with him, and not once did we ever feel a hint of racism or prejudicial treatment from him. Rather, from the very first day, he has treated our family with the utmost respect. When I asked him about this most serious allegation, he was very remorseful and extended an apology to me because he thought I was offended. I had to stop him because the truth is that I have known him to be fair and very welcoming to me and my family. Our personal relationship and experiences with him show the opposite of what the article is depicting him to be. We strongly believe that the allegations are far from the truth. I ask you, your office, and others that know Paul to not tarnish his good name or injure him by branding him as a racist because he is not. In this changing cultural evolution, there are times when we are quick to judge anything that may appear as racist, but I can vouch for this man as I have known him to be a good man, a man of respect and integrity, an honorable man. That concludes that letter. Supervisor, I'm sorry. That is one of the first letters that I've not seen previously. Could you just repeat the resident's name? Yes. And the address? Okay, thank you. Yep. Let me open it back up again. I'm anyway. sorry. I'm sorry. No, I was trying okay. to get mute off. I, I apologize. Nope, that's okay. Uh, Reverend Bernardo Martinez. Thank you. And, uh, thank, I have not seen that. I don't know if my colleagues have seen it and I just missed it. But I, I didn't want to overlook that one. Thank you. And I, I don't believe that there's an address attached. Okay, thank you. Yep. We have our next letter is from Jean and Suzanne Kimura of 4029 Windsor Drive. They write, we wish to state our strong opposition to the extension of Windsor Drive to River Road. Side roads funnel a great deal of traffic onto Windsor Drive where speed and safety are already an issue. Adding hundreds more cars per day would only make this worse. The town's comprehensive plan states, quote, as road traffic and speeds increase, the road becomes a barrier, safety becomes a problem, and the sense of neighborhood is lost, unquote. This is exactly what will happen if the extension is built. We do support the Kelt property development with a multi-use path linking pedestrians and bikers to the River Road bike trail and parks. That concludes that letter. Next letter. This is uh, submitted by John Lamellon of Glen Meadow Court. John writes, Dear Nis Unit Town Board, I believe it is important for the Town Board to formally authorize the Racial Equality and Justice Task Force proposed by Councilwoman Rosemary Perez Jaquith in the Town Board meeting on June 30th. Formation of this task force is an important step for Nis Unit to identify and correct racial inequities and discrimination in our town. As suggested by Councilwoman Jaquith, the scope of this task force should include a quote, comprehensive review of all town policies, practices, programs, and services, unquote. This broad scope is exactly what we need and extends far beyond executive order number 203, which requires a comprehensive review of Niskina policing practices. I also believe that this task force should be led by people of color, specifically African-American members of our community. As a white man, I stand ready to assist and amplify as directed. I'll be watching and 
I will be watching the board meeting online and welcome your responses. I'm submitting a copy of my testimony to the town clerk for inclusion in today's town board meeting minutes. That concludes that letter. Okay. Next letter is submitted by Amy White Sule of 4080 Windsor Drive. Amy writes, my name is Amy White Sule. My husband, Scott Sule, and I reside at 4080 Windsor Drive. I'm writing to express strong opposition to the proposed Kelts Farm cut through from Windsor Drive to River Road. In the nine years our families lived at the corner of Windsor Drive and Brit Brittany Place, I have personally witnessed numerous cars speeding through the area daily. We have had our front lawn and plantings damaged by erratic drivers. I've had the small portable caution children playing sign that I purchased and placed in front of our home run over by a driver within 30 minutes of putting it on the shoulder of the road. I've watched my children and neighborhood children with great apprehension as they cross the street to ride their bicycles and walk on the multi-use path. Now with a newly licensed teenage driver in our family, my heart is in my throat when she leaves our driveway to turn onto Windsor Drive. The traffic simply moves too fast on the road. One second the road is clear and the next second a car will come barreling through with no regard for pedestrians, cyclists, or other cars. The planning board has recommended completing the cut through from Windsor to River and placing a crash gate to allow time to ascertain which traffic calming mitigations will be suitable for the eventual connection. I can tell you that I asked for traffic calming measures back in 2011 and nothing was done. I can also tell you that the newly placed speed limit sign near Fox Hollow Road has not solved the problem. I can't imagine what traffic calming measures will be dreamed up, but I can assure you that if this cut through is completed and eventually opened, the addition of nearly 1,000 new trips per day down Windsor Drive will make an already bad situation much, much worse. Whether or not this cut through and development is part of a long range plan is entirely besides the point. As we are all acutely aware in this present global pandemic, plans that have been made in the past may no longer be practical or even possible due to evolving conditions. What was desired in 1989 may not be necessary or feasible today. There are too many residents now living on Windsor Drive and the surrounding streets that have legitimate fears for their own safety and the safety of others. 30 years ago when this plan was proposed, there may not have been such concerns due to the few people living in the neighborhoods. Now the situation has changed and to blindly, blindly charge ahead with an outdated proposal seems foolish at best and potentially tragic at worst. I appeal to your good common sense and ask you to please listen to your constituents and our very serious, very real concerns. There should be no vehicular connection from Windsor Drive to River Road. Not now, not eventually, not ever. Thank you for your time and attention. And our next uh, privilege of the floor is actually a compilation of uh, a number of letters. So it's, it's gonna take me a little bit to get through, but I'm gonna start. And it begins, Supervisor Syed and board members Murphy McGraw, Delarada, Perez Jaquith, and McCartland. My name is Art Pasquariello. My wife Lydia and I reside at 4016 Windsor Drive. I would like to explain the actions to be taken at the meeting this evening by the Windsor Drive residents during the privilege of the floor. We acknowledge that this is not the public hearing for the Kelts Farm application, but we want to provide our input now so that we can begin our participation in the early stages of the review process. As you know, the Windsor Drive neighborhood strongly opposes the connection of Windsor to River Road. We disagree with the decision of the planning board dated June 22nd, 2020, which recommended the construction of the roadway connection but with an emergency gate installed until traffic mitigation could be implemented on the Windsor Drive corridor. The use of the crash gate is a temporary action by the planning board. It is clearly not a solution. Moreover, the segmenting of a connection does not conform to the requirements of the State Environmental Equality Review Act. In this message, six statements will be presented by the residents. Our attorney, John Tingley, will also be submitting a statement which will explain in detail our position regarding the connection and why it should not be made. You will also be receiving statements of opinion for many other from many other neighbors. Please know that we are unified in our resolve to oppose this connection. Thank you for your attention. And it continues. 
Dear Supervisor Said and members of the town board, my name is Dimple Gussie. My husband, Pawan, and I live at 4076 Windsor Drive. We appreciate the opportunity for our comments to be read during privilege of the floor. Over the past three months, we have heard argument from the planning board that the road connection was always in the comprehensive plan since 1989. Reading through pages of old archives, one question constantly crossed my mind. How does an option conceived 30 years ago still hold merit in the year 2020? In the past 30 years, a lot has changed globally and locally. To name a few, we are all using a host of new technologies like internet, broadband, LED, cell phones, GPS, MRI, and Facebook, et cetera. Talking about local changes, Ms. Hewn has changed from predominantly farm area to a developed suburban area. Many new commercial sites have opened up like ShopRite Plaza, Rivers Casino, Mohawk Commons, new luxury apartments across from ShopRite. Over the past 30 years, Windsor Drive has had a share of changes. With completion of phases of Windsor Estates, it has 40 homes abutting either side of the road with most of the households having school-aged children. We are all aware of the importance of flexibility in our, in our lives based on science, evidence, and data. For example, a common household acid-reducing drug, Zantac, that was in market for more than 40 years was recently taking off, taken off the market due to increased cancer risk. The comprehensive plan similarly has to be assessed from time to time to make relevant changes based on facts. A review of the comprehensive plan of 2013 includes the pages listed by, planning board, by the planning board and their June 22nd decision support our position of only a multi-use path and no road connection. To this, I will list a few paragraphs from the comprehensive plan of 2013. Page one, paragraph one. Quote, finally, the comprehensive plan presents a snapshot of the town at a particular time and should not be viewed as static, but rather as a dynamic policy instrument to be modified as needed to reflect changing conditions. Page five, paragraph two. The preservation of community character not only has wide support from residents, its preservation makes economic sense as quality of life is one of the things that most employers are looking for when relocating a business operation. Page five, paragraph five. Future additions and improvements to the transportation system should provide a balance of connectivity options that reflect the increasing importance of pedestrian and bike transportation modes. In addition, future transportation system improvements should minimize impacts to existing neighborhoods. Page 21, paragraph one. As road traffic and speeds increase, the road becomes a barrier, safety becomes a problem, and the sense of neighborhood is lost. Therefore, it is important that NISUNA's plan reflect a transportation system that is not only efficient, but promotes safety and flexibility. It should also respect natural topography, residential features, and present an attractive streetscape. My second concern is traffic related that once again stems from changes in the past 30 years. According to Pew Research, 96% of Americans own a cell phone, up from 35% in 2011. 90% of smartphone owners use their phone to get directions. Given those facts of GPS, Windsor Drive road connection, as traffic study indicated, will result in approximately 1,000 cars per day in addition to 3,750 cars. This through traffic will lead to an increased risk of accident, accidents and hence pose a safety risk to our children. To highlight additional ramifications of this cut through, I would like to share an article from the New York Times by Lisa Fordero, dated December 24, 2017, entitled, Navigation Apps Are Turning Quiet Neighborhoods Into Traffic Nightmares. The police chief is one of the neighborhoods. This chief is one of the neighborhoods. Quote, Without question, the game changer has been the nav navigation apps. Unquote. We have had days when people can't get out of their driveway. The situation is not unheard of on Windsor Drive during AM rush hour, as might have been experienced by board members dropping their kids off to high school. Keeping these evidence-based facts in mind, it is my hope that the town board members will make their decision based not on historical preference, but based on facts and science that we have shared. Connectivity is a beautiful thing and should not be extrapolated to a road connection. Pedestrian and bike connectivity is the 21st century urban planning concept. New concept in planning is not how we send more cars through this road, but how we can send more people biking and walking down the street. This is in sync with the CDC goal of promoting physical and mental health by encouraging healthy behaviors. 
A multi-use path alone without the road connection accomplishes all of our shared goals listed below. Those goals are number one, safety of current and future residents. Number two, saving community character. Number three, maintaining property values on Windsor Drive. Number four, promoting public health by encouraging healthy behaviors like biking and walking. Number five, saving the environment through less of a carbon footprint. And number six, saving public tax dollars because there's no need for additional traffic slash environmental impact study. Implement the road. Okay, and the next letter in this compilation. Supervisor, can I just stop you for one second? Is yep. Bill Lawrence on the call? Um, I'm getting texts from residents saying they're unable to log on. Um, they believe that there might be too many people on. I don't know if that's accurate. I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm going by text and I'm trying to listen to the, the supervisor speak at the same time. So we can take a brief respite if uh, Bill okay. Lawrence. I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Would you like a glass of water? <laughs> I don't envy you in the least. Um, Bill Lawrence, are you on? Yes, yes, I am. Do you, on your end, is there anything that indicates folks are having a tough time getting on? I'm, I have, I have no way of knowing that. I have okay. no control over that. Okay. Um, but I, I heard at one point that, um, that it's possible that there's people who are putting in the wrong password. And so they're getting locked out, but I don't, I haven't really have no way of knowing what's going on. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if the queue filled up or yeah, I don't know either. We'll, we'll just bam for a minute. So Yasmin could keep drinking water and you know, take a deep <laughs> breath. Um, but you don't, so you're not seeing that we're at capacity or something here. I, I, I have no view into that. Any of those statistics. Okay, Bill. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. I did my best supervisor. Hey, Bill. Uh, yes. um, I have had a weird thing happen every once in a while where it's not telling me that people are trying to get in. And it does. I have, If I log out as the administrator of the meeting and then log back in, every once in a while it pops up with some people's requests. And then the only other thing is if they're clicking on the live stream link but then trying to use, like, the login, there's a difference between the live stream that they're trying to view, and I know some people have problems viewing the live stream, and that's yeah. actually logging into the meeting in which you need that Google Dots meeting dot, you know. Right. I password. know that, yeah, I know that they can't use their, their personal Gmail address. The only way that they can view the meeting is to log in using the live stream at miscuna.org and the NISCI 12309 password is the only way they'll be able to view the live stream. Bill, so may I ask you to repeat that one more time because I sure. think there are some people on who are getting contacted by other people. Sure. And maybe we can ask some of our friends, Ann Berger and Marina and others to try to spread the word while we're continuing sure. to do business here. I just sure. tried the login and it worked. I mean, I logged out of this meeting and used the NISCI in a live stream, followed the instructions and it allowed me in. So it must be that people aren't using the right password. Okay. Yeah, they just have to remember they can't log they can't be logged into like Google Chrome with their Gmail account, um, which it specifically um, talks about that in the live stream instructions. They need to log out and log back in as a uh, live stream at NISCUNA.org and use the NISCI 12309 uh, password. That's the only way it works. Bill, thank you very much. Okay. I really appreciate it. Sorry okay. to call you in from the bench, coach. Nah. No, I'm, I'm here, I'm listening to everything. <laughs> Supervisor. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, hopefully, uh, if, if anyone can hear me out there, if you go to www.nisuna.org, there are instructions on the website for how to uh, access the live stream. So um, hopefully it works for you. If people are continuing to have some problems or questions, just let me know. One, one other thing I might add is that the link is different for every meeting. Mm -hmm. So they have to specifically yeah. go to the calendar and tonight's meeting the uh, the entry on the calendar for tonight's meeting and use that specific link to get to this meeting. Mm -hmm. They can't reuse a link from a previous meeting. Correct. Okay. 
How yeah. far along are we, Yasmin? Um, we're uh, we, we have the home stretch. Yeah, we have no. <laughs> so a few more to get there in this compilation, and then I will likely uh, take take a more extended break for about five minutes, and then we'll um, revisit the next dozen that we have uh, waiting to come. So I'll, I'll continue here with this compilation. And it begins, dear Supervisor Syed and board members Murphy McGraw, Delarada, McFarland, and Perez Jaquith, please accept these comments submitted by Daniela and Bernardo Bigali, living at 4060 Windsor Drive in advance of the public hearing regarding the average density development of the Celts Farm. We firmly believe the full access connection slash temporary emergency access will negatively impact the neighborhood, while a design with a multi-use slash bike path connection will not. We would like to provide some information regarding emergency access, given the resolution approved by the planning board. The emergency crash gate is not a viable option, as it is designed in a way that will likely result in the future opening of the road. This would bring every issue, old and new, right back to the surface. It is clear that the eventual opening of the gate and cut through is really part of this project. And the gate is just a mechanism for the planning board to attempt to avoid addressing traffic impacts that they openly acknowledge would exist and cause concern. Some examples as it relates to this statement, the planning board characterized the temporary emergency access option as a compromise that, was, that would result in opening. The planning board chair encouraged opening without a further traffic study being completed beforehand. The planning board recommendation provides for the developer to pave the cut through, et cetera. Following a conversation with the town planner, the statement made at the planning board session regarding emergency access and cul-de-sac requirements have been amended and a correction was sent following the planning board meeting. It is clear that the code does not limit a length of cul-de-sac or require additional se secondary access for a development with less than 30 units. Please see an excerpt from the applicable codes per the statement made. Quote, Town of Niskuna Code, Section 189-17, cul-de-sac. Where cul-de-sacs are designed to be permanent, they should, in general, not exceed 500 feet in length and shall terminate in a circular turnaround, having a minimum right-of-way radius of 60 feet and pavement radius of 45 feet. Two, the entire pavement radius shall be paved. Three, at the end of temporary dead-end streets, a temporary turnaround with a pavement radius of 45 feet shall be provided unless the planning board approves an alternative. Fire Code Appendix D, Section D 107.1. One or two family dwelling residential developments, developments of one or two family dwellings where the number of dwelling units exceeds 30 shall be provided with two separate and improved fire apparatus access roads. After researching, there are more than 20 cul-de-sacs in the town of Niskuna that are greater than 500 feet in length and have only one entrance slash exit. Please see attached Exhibit A labeled Niskuna cul-de-sac map illustrating the locations. Additionally, there are four emergency access slash crash gates in the town, none of which up to this point have been needed during an emergency. As an aside, it's worth noting one of these gates provide access to the rear of an apartment complex only, and another was required by the Department of Transportation due to safety concerns when the traffic circle was built at the bottom of Balltown Road and the Rexford Bridge. It is also worth mentioning that the fire chief is unable to remember a time when any of those four gates needed to be used or a time where a development that had a single ingress slash egress was blocked during an emergency and prevented a fire truck from getting to the scene within District 1. The reason for this distills down to probability, the likelihood of two low probability events happening simultaneously, an emergency and an entrance being blocked is insignificantly low. Regarding property value, two independent appraisers indicated our property value would be adversely impacted. This speaks directly to marketability and desirability for a home. These opinions are provided by for professionals who've been in residential lending for decades. One appraiser estimates anywhere from 10% to 35% reduction in value and states he conferred, conferred with two additional appraisers and three real estate agents. The second appraiser indicated that this road extension would interfere with the definition of quiet enjoyment, which is defined as the right of an occupant of real property, particularly of a residence to enjoy and use premises in peace and without interference. He states this interference would cause a negative impact on the market value for not only the residents of Windsor Drive, but for those in the Kells Farm subdivision. 
where we respectfully ask you to reflect on all of the information the neighborhood has provided and agree that the proposed plan that temporarily prevents this cut through is simply not the right decision. Please consider a multi-use path only with no vehicular or emergency access. And the next letter is submitted by Connie and Paul Trager of 4072 Windsor Drive. And they write, for almost four months, residents of the Windsor Drive area have closely scrutinized many aspects of the Windsor Drive to River Road cut through issue. The scrutiny has led me to see the proposal to create a fully paved connection with a crash gate as a plan supported by pillars of rationales, including the comprehensive plan, old maps, a traffic study, connectivity, emergency access, other committees votes, compromise, an existing 40 year length of paved road and others. These pillars have been used to prop up the ultimate rationale pillar under the proposal. The planning board's desire to connect Windsor Drive to River Road, and they are crumbling under the weight of not only the increased scrutiny, but the detrimental impacts of increased traffic on Windsor Drive and its neighboring streets. The plan as proposed cannot be considered the end of the story. Any examination of the proposal has to recognize that what is actually being considered is an open connection to River Road. Sections of the comprehensive plan have been cherry picked to support the connection. However, inconsistencies and contradictions within it have compromised, compromised its own use as well as in the planning, planning board report that accompanied their proposal as it quotes the comprehensive plan. Planning board members have acknowledged these contradictions and the confusion and misperceptions they may cause, but that did not prevent them from using them in the report, which contains troubling contradictions of its own. For instance, the Comprehensive Plan Committee co-chair chose to include sections of the plan that ref refer to connections and arterial management, traffic circulation, and interconnectivity. He did not include other sections that support connecting only with a multi-use path and that caution against traffic planning for traffic's sake only. A partial list would include sections that refer to extending Windsor Drive with a multi-use path and making it a priority. The importance of multi-use paths as non-motorized vehicular links connecting residents with work, school, and shopping, and most importantly, in no instance should transportation planning be concerned with transportation services alone. The road and pedestrian network is a key factor in the safety, social workings, and visual impact of a community. The plan also cautions that the new development should not compromise the integrity of the surrounding neighborhoods. The pillar of the comprehensive plan is not a stable one. The objectives from the comprehensive plan that were chosen would lead one to believe that the planning board's proposal to include a cut through is meant to promote connectivity and benefit not just the Windsor Drive neighborhood, but all Niski neighborhoods. It states a need for connectivity between neighborhoods to parks and the town center overlay district. However, this section in the report was immediately followed by a list of methods generated by various committees as examples of ways to limit the amount of non-neighborhood traffic using the cut through. Hard twists, bends, curves, turns, weight limits, a stop sign, a boulevard entrance. So the proposal contains rationales for creating a connection for drivers from other neighborhoods, but with features designed to deter those neighbors, those drivers from using it. The question I posed to the planning board was, if the cut through is for the neighborhood, but not the non-neighborhood, and they have received ample evidence that the neighborhood closest to the cut through doesn't need it and doesn't want it, and committees have put conditions on its completion that don't have any scope design, timeline, or budget, what's going on here? Is it just paying lip service to the comprehensive plan or the town map or a short stub of paved road? The planning board members talked about not wanting to isolate the new development by not connecting it to Windsor Drive. Aside from the fact that it is common knowledge that cul-de-sacs and streets without connections to busier thoroughfares are desirable, the cost of connectivity to new neighbors would be thousands of cars a day passing through their small development as opposed to approximately 24 from their immediate neighbors. The pillar of connectivity doesn't hold up. Within the planning board's report are other inconsistencies that aren't reassuring. The requirement for traffic mitigation before opening the gate is described in one section as when the town's budget allows for traffic calming treatments in the neighborhood and in another until it is potentially implemented and approved for opening. So at some point in the future, if there's a crash gate and the question of turning it into a connection is brought up again, 
Which phrase will town leaders pick? The traffic calming treatments are made in the neighborhood phrase or the potentially implemented phrase? Planning board members have acknowledged that the increase in traffic on Windsor Drive determined by the traffic study done by the developer and reviewed by an engineer hired by the town is a concern. They also doubted the numbers based on personal preference and asked for the report to be revised to restate the numbers in a form that made them appear less troubling which removed a reference to the potential impact on the character of the neighborhood. At the same time, the developer's traffic engineer acknowledged that the study was limited in its scope due to the cost to expand it. A traffic study is not a sturdy rationale if the portions which do not support the proposal are not taken into consideration and it is acknowledged to be incomplete. The crash gate has been described by the planning board as a, comp as a compromise between residents and the comprehensive plan. But the contradictory statements about what would be required to remove the crash gate reveal that it is a placeholder and the only way to protect both the existing community and the new neighbors is to have no connection besides a multi-use path. The idea of compromise is a temporary rationale that does not adequately support the proposal. The introduction of the comprehensive plan says that it, quote, represents a snapshot of the town at a particular time and should not be viewed as static, but rather as dynamic policy instrument to be modified as needed to reflect changing conditions. It is appropriate to look at the plan and master plans, official maps and other documents from the past 50 years. And using the information that has been learned since their creation say, the connection is not a good idea anymore. We're not going to require that the developer include a feature that will adversely impact the surrounding neighborhood and include a condition that will have to be paid for by the town. We have a better idea based on data, neighborhood feedback, observations about changes in the surrounding areas and a shared responsibility to keep expenditures down. Don't put in a vehicular connection. The planning board didn't go that route, so we are asking you to. Please approve the special use permit with the condition that there be a multi-use path connection only. I've only covered a couple of the rationales and used to support the planning board's proposal, but the pillar supporting the multi-use path only configuration, safety, not adding to existing traffic issues, connectivity via walking and biking, preservation of the character of the existing neighborhood, not burdening the town with mitigation costs are stronger and will hold up over time. And that concludes the fourth letter in that compilation. I'm about halfway through um, this compilation. So I am gonna take a uh, brief break here. We've been reading for about an hour. So, um, if we could all reconvene at 8.15, that would be great.
Okay. We're gonna continue with privilege of the floor. Our next letter is submitted by Soma D and Rajib Dutta of 4101 Windsor Drive and they write, Dear Supervisor Syed and board members Perez Jaquith, Murphy McGraw, Delarada and McPartland. My name is Soma D. My husband Rajib Dada and I live at 4101 Windsor Drive located next to the Kelts Farm. Over the last four months, we have repeatedly voiced our concerns in opposition to the Windsor Drive River Road cut through with or without a crash gate and, a, and our support to the extension of a multi-use bike path only. I hope that by now you have received a holistic view of our thoughts and reasons for opposing the cut through. So I'd like to provide some context about how we learned about this project and our journey since then. Living next to the Celts farm in the past year, we had constantly observed activities in the lot, cutting of trees, clearing out of land, and then demolition of the house that once stood there. Then one day near the end of February, we were informed by the builder Joel, that he was going to be making a development and he was opposed to the proposed Windsor Drive extension. He mentioned that the town was pushing for this extension and that there would be a public hearing regarding these matters on March 9th. I talked to some of our neighbors who shared a lot of the same feelings of confusion because why would we be learning about such a major change in our neighborhood, neighborhood from the builder? None of the Windsor Drive residents had prior knowledge of this plan and many were specifically told by the town before purchasing their home that a connection to River Road or development would never happen because of the wetlands. Then in the next few months, we spent countless hours researching, pouring through meeting records, annotating comprehensive plans, and learning about various committees whose recommendations are required and instrumental to the town planning board and hence the town board's decision. I went through the meeting minutes, hours of video, recording of previous meetings, and listened to live streams. Here are some of my recurring findings that summarize the contradictions and inconsistencies in the process of the proposal's advancement. Number one, for months the town planner, town planning board and various committees were discussing the Windsor Drive cut through while we were kept totally in the dark. The plan was being pushed through various committees to create a streamlined approval process without any real data. The only information that the committees worked with was a traffic report which has been universally agreed to be thoroughly incomplete. And even with the incomplete data, most of the planning board members agree that the additional traffic is too high. However, it did not matter for the planning board since the objective of the process was to increase connectivity without furnishing any quantified benefits. Two, a major reason cited by the CAC for favoring the cut through is that a reduction of about 0.5 miles will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is the most hypocritical claim I've read in this project. Even if I take at face value that there is an appreciable positive environmental impact, it can only happen if there is a substantial diversion of traffic through Windsor with significant reduction in time. But the town planning board is saying that nobody is going to take the cut through, maybe 25% of the traffic volume, and there will be traffic calming measures, so where is the greenhouse gas reduction coming from? In fact, this plan just diverts the pollution from River Road to Windsor Drive Based on EPA estimates for a two mile stretch, each car would produce 808 grams of carbon dioxide. With 1,000 more cars, Windsor Drive will see an increase of 808 kilograms of CO2 per day. That is close to one metric ton. With heavier vehicles, it will be much more. Since Windsor is not as open as River Road, this will have much more of a detrimental impact on our environment. Has the committee done any qualified analysis? Number three, I have observed time and again that whenever any committee member has questioned or asked about the merit of this cut through and the subsequent traffic impact, that person was quickly cut off and stopped from expressing their viewpoints. Discussions in these committees should have been unbiased and fact-based. For an example, please watch the June 3rd CAC meeting video. In fact, one of the CAC members raised legitimate concerns. However, his questions were strongly downplayed by other members, and finally, he abstained from voting. It is bothering to notice that some committee members do not have a good grasp on what they're voting for. I was disappointed by how the committee members were filling out the Environmental Assessment Form, EAF, based on their gut feelings rather than facts. Number five, CSC unanimously recommends the extension based on the following. 
one, it is desirable for the homeowner. There's no such homeowner on Windsor Drive that they take a survey. Two, property value increases because of connection to the park. In fact, appraisal shows up to 30% drop in prices. Three, only 25% increase in traffic, which is based purely on opinion of the planning board. Again, this approval process was not based on any factual evidence other than an incomplete traffic study report. Number six, while the role of the EDHPC would be to analyze the proposal objectively and critically and to bring forth any limitations or deficits that are omitted by other committees, it simply aided the approval of the proposal without any data. It is as if these committees are working in a concerted way. CAC has approved the proposal, so CAC needs to approve two. In fact, one CAC member commented that they need to honor the CSC decision. It is expected in a town like Nisuna that these decisions are taken in a qualified and skillful manner. In conclusion, the only solution that is acceptable to us is the bike path. It is environmentally friendly, will not permanently alter the characteristics of our neighborhood while increasing the connectivity to Blatnick Park. Though the rubber stamp approvals to push the extension through, crash gate option at River Road is just to delay the connection, are collected from CSC, CAC, EDHPC, and the planning board, we feel there is a lack of real due diligence in the process. We have now spent countless hours studying, researching, and gathering data that speak volumes against the cut through. We hope you will listen to us. After all, we are the people who live on the street and will suffer the consequences of this decision. Thank you for reading our comments and listening to us. And the next letter is submitted on behalf of Raul Chakawala. And Raul writes, Dear Supervisor Syed and members of the town board, I, Raul Chakwala, and my wife Florence are residents of 4089 Windsor Drive. We appreciate your efforts in reading our statements concerning the future of our wonderful neighborhood, now threatened by the Planning Board's Resolution 2020-17. The possibility of a connection of Windsor Drive with River Road is of considerable worry to us and our fellow Windsor neighbors. One way to express the seriousness of our concern is by sharing with you that collectively the participating neighbors have spent 1400 to 1500 hours over the past three months listening to the planning board's meetings, the conservation advisory council and complete streets committee deliberations, taking notes, conducting research, analyzing, consulting and reporting findings. Statements you have read preceding this one may have provided the town board members a glimpse of the work that we have conducted. It should also be noted that the amount of time that this matter is occupied under mines is incalculable. Today, we would like to bring to your attention something that is glaringly missing from the planning board's resolution report. Any substantive explanation of the benefits to our community of a cut through, which is their expressed intention behind the resolution. This is quite disappointing to us considering that we have made repeated requests to the planning board for the same. Not only were our requests made with silence, met with silence, but astonishingly, we have seen the board members consistently undermine our stated specific concerns backed by our investigations. This has left us with a sense of helplessness, to be honest. The following may be considered as exhibits in support of the situation just described. The planning board's May 11th meeting, Mark Nadalny, a traffic expert with Creed Manning engineers summarized their findings concerning increased traffic on Windsor Drive that were connected with River Road. His estimate was 90% of cars on River Road, which currently turn left on Van Antwerp Road, would use the shortcut and thereby add 950 additional trips per day to Windsor Drive. The board members aggressively questioned the 90% diversion assumption and asked for tabulations spread down to 25%, which the traffic expert compiled to in the revised report. The board's pushback on the 90% diversion was subsequently rejected by the GPI review of a study which confirmed the 85 to 90% diversion. When, when he was asked, Mark clarified that only local NIST unit destinations were considered as adding farther destinations and intersections would exponentially increase the cost of the study. Strangely, none of the board members followed, followed up with obvious concerns that the study scope was limited due to budgetary constraints. Instead, they proceeded to question Mark's cautioning that Windsor Drive would change from an urban local road to closer to an urban collector. Mark in a revised report 
diluted freezing to essentially when their drive will continue its characteristic. Complete Streets Committee, 29th May meeting. The planning board representative presented that the cut through is desirable to the homeowners, that the property value will increase and traffic will increase only by 25%. The CSC voted seven to zero in favor of the cut through. The planning board's June 1st special meeting with the residents. This is the first and the only time that the residents had a face-to-face -face meeting with the planning board and the only opportunity for us to learn about the supposed benefits to the community. We were disappointed that the only reasoning they provided was that this was mentioned in our archived comprehensive plans and is somehow allowed in the most recent one of 2013. On our part, we provided a PowerPoint presentation to illustrate our concerns that one, CME's report is clearly incomplete as it leaves out north, northward branching of the River Road beyond the research circle and connecting to the city of Schenectady via Providence Ave and Niskina de destinations via Walltown Road. We reminded them that according to the CMA traffic engineer, adding these destinations would have exponentially increased costs. The study therefore was underscoped, likely due to budgetary constraints. Two, if the missing segments are added, the number of additional vehicles shortcutting through Windsor Drive and Knott Street could be twice or thrice as many. Three, additional risk of potential harm to the neighborhood children, 40 plus walkers and bikers. Four, even 950 additional trips would dump as much as half a metric ton of CO2 a day on the Windsor neighborhood. And five, there could be up to 30% devaluation of the property value on Windsor Drive according to appraisals conducted. The Conservation Advisory Council June 3rd meeting. Reduction in greenhouse gas emissions associated with a half a mile reduction in the drive distance was a basis for approval. While well, one of the three committee members showed concerns for traffic hazards for the Windsor residents and asked about consulting an expert, he was encouraged to abstain. He happened to be a new member. The Planning Board's June 8th meeting. We were looking forward to this meeting with the expectation that the planning board after our face-to-face -face meeting on the 1st of June would reconsider the cut through and would allow Kelts Farm subdivision developer Joel Bazoin to present his preferred and worked out plan that has a multi-purpose path without the cut through. So we were quite dismayed that he was not allowed to do so from what we understand. The board after hearing one more round of our statements proceeded to pass a straw vote based on what turned out to be an erroneous reference to the codes concerning a requirement for additional secondary access to cul-de-sacs. As far as our feedback from the June 1st special meeting is concerned, each of our concerns were basically dismissed as the residents feeling repeatedly. They see page 27 on planning board packet from 6-22-2020. The planning board's June 22nd meeting, many of us having lost confidence in convincing the board members refrained from participating and silently witnessed the board unanimously approved resolution 2020-17. There are repeated assurances since March that their minds were not, quote, made up, and that this was, quote, not a done thing, ringing hollow in our minds. So this brings us to today's town board regular meeting, which while not intended to cover the subject of our concern, providers, hopefully, our best opportunity to save the Windsor neighborhood from the sword of Demo Damocles, that resolution 2020-17 is. There is a better way. The Celts Farm subdivision plan with a multi-purpose path connecting the new community and providing this new to residents and environmentally and people-friendly access to the facilities on River Road. And here's the seventh letter in the compilation. And it begins Supervisor Syed and board members Murphy McGraw, Delorada, Perez Jaquith, and McPartland. Submitted by Art Pasquariello of 4016 Windsor Drive. I wish to add, address two issues, one dealing with a specific aspect of the planning board's decision dated June 22, 2020. And the second will cover the legal criteria for the granting of a special use permit and the approval for an average density development district. Issue one. In its decision, the planning board spent considerable time to show that the connection of Windsor Drive to River Road had been discussed for many years. Minutes from planning board meetings in 1989, 1996, and 2001, as well as the comprehensive plan 83 addressed the connection. 
When you read the minutes for the meetings, you see referrals to other agencies who participated in the research work for the board resolutions. Interestingly, there is never a reference to a traffic count, a traffic study, or a traffic projection of any kind by those boards to show that they address traffic volume in any way. Just build the road. It would appear that the first traffic study was not conducted on Windsor until 2020 when it was ordered as part of the Celts Farm application. That study, completed by Creed and Manning, revealed a projected increase in vehicle trips per day of 950. While we believe the number to be higher, the study further states that the connection may increase the number of vehicle trips per day on Windsor to 4,685. The issue of traffic volume, congestion, and safety were not topics of discussion as seen in those planning board minutes from prior years. What if those planning boards in 1989, 1996, and 2001 knew that in the year 2020, a traffic study would show the vehicle trips stated above would result from the Windsor to River connection? Do you think the dialogue about a connection to Windsor to River might have been modified or completely eliminated? Issue two, the legal requirements applicable to this application are relatively strict. Regarding average density development, section 230-28 H1 of the Nisuna Town Ordinance states that such development shall not be detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of the persons residing in the vicinity or injurious to property or improvements within its proximity. It seems clear that this criteria has not been satisfied. The significant increase in traffic volume and the resulting safety and noise issues will change the character of the Windsor Drive neighborhood. This has been acknowledged by the planning board. Further, as shown by the two opinion letters from licensed experienced appraisers, home values will suffer and be reduced by 10% to 20%. Hence, there is injury to property or improvements within proximity of the Kelts Farm subdivision. The above stated ordinance provision cannot be met. Regarding special use permits, section 220-60 of the Nisuna Town Ordinance states that certain factors must be considered by the town board to safeguard public health and convenience and as may be required for the preservation of the general character of the neighborhood. Herein, it seems clear the traffic volume again with its related problems of noise and traffic safety harms the Windsor neighborhood, brings down property values and diminishes the beautiful character of the homes. The general character of the Windsor neighborhood is not preserved as required by the ordinance. Additionally, the attempted segmentation of the traffic issue on Windsor will violate section 274B8 of the town law of the state of New York, which section requires compliance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act as part of this special review process. For the reasons stated above, the legal standards required for the Windsor connection have not been satisfied or specially submitted our past for yellow. That concludes that compilation. We have our next letter is submitted by <clears throat> Tina Lee of 1106 Glen Meadow Court. And Tina writes, Dear Supervisor Syed and town board members, thank you for your support of creating the task force for racial equity and justice and starting an independent investigation of the blackface incident. I am ready to express my concern for the proposal to appoint town attorney Paul Briggs as the director of human resources. Based on recent events, we clearly have a human resource challenge in town hall. I believe that the seriousness of the current situation requires the skills of a human resources professional. This professional would bring important experience assisting similar municipalities with similar challenges. This position would also be relatively quick to fill by securing a short-term contractor instead of adding this assignment to the town attorney's plate, frankly, it is not fair to Paul Briggs to expect him to serve this critical role without the requisite professional HR experience. We should take this opportunity to move forward, building a race equity culture at the town hall. As Karen Suarez stated in her book entitled, The Role of Senior Leaders in Building a Race, equity, race Equality Culture, quote, Building a race equity culture requires a nuanced approach rooted in an understanding of the history and context of structural racism. While each organization's journey is unique, our research suggests that all organizations undergo three stages of change, which we termed the race equity cycle. And those are awake, increased representation in organizations focused on increasing the number of 
increasing the number of people from different racial backgrounds, woke, greater inclusion aimed at integral internal change in behaviors, policies, and practices so that everyone is comfortable sharing their experiences and equipped to talk about race inequities, work, consistent application of a race equity lens to examine how organizations and programs operate. With these three important stages of change in mind, I urge the board to hire a human resources professional with the appropriate background and training who can work with the town board and town leaders toward a race equity culture that ensures all employees can thrive. I have provided a copy of this testimony to the town clerk for inclusion in the official town board meeting minutes. And that concludes that letter. Next letter was submitted by Matthew Lean of 221 Brittany Place. And Matthew Wright, Supervisor Said, and board members Murphy McGraw, Delarada, Perez Jaquith, and McPartland. I am writing to express concern and opposition to resolution 2020 176 regarding the Kelts Farm development and, in particular, the Windsor Drive extension. When my family and I selected our property and built our home, We decided not only to live in the town of Nisuna, but also in the Windsor Estates development. The character of the suburban community was centered around winding and non-grid based streets, setbacks, quiet streets with children playing in them, and a host of cul-de-sacs. The only traffic passing within more than a few blocks is local traffic from local neighbors. Upon arriving at Windsor Estates in Nisuna, we progressed from Balltown Road to Knott Street, where we passed the school, town hall, police station, and library. Once we passed Van Antwerp Road, the street name changed from Knott Street to Windsor Drive, and we were greeted with a sign at the entrance to Windsor Drive with a sign denoting the Windsor community. As we visited the model home at 4060 Windsor Drive and the garage office on July 21st, 2012, we asked a host of questions regarding the Stub Road at the end of Windsor. We were assured that first the intention was to continue the residential R1 development with a bike path extension, we were explicitly told that there would be no connection to River Road due to the wetlands. We later researched this deeply. This is a concern for us as we liked the nature and character of the residential community. We read the comprehensive plan and dug into historical news articles on the potential of the road being continued. As far back as the 1960s, there were attempts to extend Knott Street through the river. In fact, the attempts in 1966 and 1968 sourced from the Times Record newspaper, both did not go through. Interestingly, engineers from New York State required that the roads be four lanes wide due to the tremendous traffic flow that was anticipated. Taking both a comprehensive plan, which outlines that the town has agreed that only a multi-use path connection be made between Windsor and River Road, and the fact that prior efforts would be an extension of Knott Street through no existing development and the existing roadways were not wide enough to accommodate a tremendous traffic load as identified in 1968, one could easily surmise that the connection was no longer feasible. Additionally, it would also see, be seen as solidified by the naming of Windsor Drive as Windsor Drive and not Knott Street once you pass me into a road. Along with the signage of 4000 Windsor Drive denoting the Windsor Estates community and clear confirmation from the developer that the intent was to extend the R1 development and not create an arterial thoroughfare would convince the buyer that any thoroughfare connection would be out of the character of the community and not align with the town's plans. The plan for the arterial thoroughfare has obviously been on the minds of the town going back to the 1960s and perhaps sooner. At one point in my research, I discovered that one of the initial planning intents for connecting Knott Street to River Road was to create a commercial center at the conceptual intersection of River and Knott. Throughout the years, the planning board has codified the character and nature of the community through their approvals and recommendations to the town board. These recommendations have created a community of Windsor Estates with the setbacks, road layout, road naming, signage and curb cuts going past the board. Over these years, the planning board has codified the nature of the Windsor Estates community. While the road has been built wider than the side streets by a couple of feet, the nature of the setbacks, curb cuts, and ingress egress to the side streets have been planned to support a residential community that differs from the character of Old Nisbuna. With its sidewalks, grid layout, and wide thoroughfares such as Grand Boulevard, Windsor Estates has none of these and are defining characteristics of the community. 
Over the years, the planning board has defined and approved the character and nature of the Windsor Estates community. The planning board perhaps had opportunities to require the connection in the early stages of the Windsor Estates development, and they have not proceeded to require the connection before this period of time, even on earlier residential developments that surround the Kells Farm property. Over these years, it has been accepted that there is no connection through, and the decisions regarding planning of property such as setbacks, design, shaded space from trees have been made assuming that the connection would not be made. Even the name of the street was established as Windsor Drive, taking into account that Knott Street is likely not to be continued through to River Road. I ask you to reject the resolution and turn back to the planning board to have them work with the developer to design the development to not provide a connection between Knott Street and River Road, which uses Windsor Drive as a residential cut through. And that concludes that letter. Next letter. And this is submitted by the attorney for the Windsor Drive residents. <clears throat> okay. And this is submitted on behalf of Jonathan Tingley. And Jonathan writes, Dear Supervisor Sia and town board members, we represent the 40 households in the Windsor Drive neighborhood listed on Schedule 1 attached here to the Windsor Drive group. We respectfully submit this letter concerning the Kelts Farm Average Density Development Proposal for the property located at 2538 River Road, known as the project. Initially, we understand that this evening is not the public hearing on the special use permit application. However, we submit this letter and the attached exhibits in an effort to permit the town board and the developer to take into consideration the legitimate concerns of the Windsor Drive group as early as possible in the process to facilitate a speedy, economically efficient, and appropriate review of the special use permit application, including under the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Accordingly, we request that this letter and its exhibits be included in the official record on this matter. As set forth below, the Windsor Drive group is, supported, is supportive of the project if the connection to Windsor Drive is limited to a multi-use slash bike path connection. Annexed here too is Exhibit A, is a sketch plan that has been provided to members of the Windsor Drive group that depicts an average density development at the site that includes only a multi-use slash bike path connection to Windsor Drive and which does not include a vehicular connection or emergency access only connection to Windsor Drive. <clears throat> the Windsor Drive group is supportive of the plan as represented on Exhibit A here too and respectfully requests that the town board and the developer pursue review of the project as depicted on Exhibit A. Review under the State Environmental Quality Review Act. As the body reviewing the special use permit application, it is our understanding that the town board will be serving as the lead agency to conduct the review under Seeker. Although the planning board recommended that the project include a fully paved connection between Windsor, Ro Windsor Road and River Road with an emergency only gate installed until such time as traffic mitigation can occur on the Windsor Drive corridor to mitigate any additional traffic impacts of a connection to the neighborhood. Seeker requires that the full action, that is the development project with a full vehicular access connection be reviewed at this time if the planning board's advisory recommendation is followed. <clears throat> Reviewing the impacts of the project taking into consideration only the impacts associated with an emergency only gate as opposed to a full vehicular connection would constitute illegal segmentation under seeker in this case. Segmentation under Seeker is the division of the environmental review of an action such that various stages are addressed separately as though they were independent, unrelated activities. Considering only a part of a segment of an action is contrary to the intent of Seeker. The regulations generally prohibiting segmentation are designed to guard against a distortion of the approval process by preventing a project with potentially significant environmental effects from being split into two or more smaller projects. Here, to the extent the developer and the town board pursue review of a project consistent 
with the planning board's advisory recommendation of including an emergency only gate at Windsor Drive. The town board will nonetheless be required to review under seeker the potential impacts associated with opening the Windsor Drive extension to full vehicular access. The opening of a Windsor Drive extension to full vehicular access would be an integral interdependent part of the development project reflected in the planning board's advisory recommendation. As demonstrated by the planning board's record and the agenda materials included for tonight's meeting. For instance, the sketch plan included in the agenda materials does not show a gate. It shows a 26 foot wide fully paved vehicular connection. In addition, the planning board stated that a barrier to residential traffic will negate any additional traffic impacts until such time as they can be mitigated which amounts to an admission that the gate is merely an attempt to defer consideration of the impact of a full roadway connection to the future, despite it being built as part of this project now. Finally, the entire premise of the planning board's advisory recommendation is that the comprehensive plan allegedly provides for a full vehicular connection from Windsor Drive to River Road. While the Windsor Drive group disagrees with the substantive merits of the planning board's advisory recommendations, this record clearly demonstrates that the opening of the Windsor Drive extension to full traffic circulation would be an integral and interdependent part of this project if designed in accordance with the planning board's advisory recommendation. Therefore, the impacts of opening the Windsor Drive extension to full vehicular access would need to be considered now under seeker, even if the current proposal were to include an emergency only gate. In this respect, we have had the traffic study performed by the applicant's consultant independently reviewed by Wayne Bonesdale PE at Master Consulting on behalf of the Windsor Drive Group, particularly with regard to the cut through traffic assessment. Mr. Bonesdale's review letter is annexed here too as Exhibit B. As set forth in Mr. Bonesdale's report, the scope of the applicant's analysis of the traffic impacts of the Windsor Drive extension is insufficient for a number of reasons. Further, as set forth in Mr. Bonesdale's report, even with that deficient scope, the data therein reflects that the extension of Windsor Drive will require preparation of an EIS under Seeker. As stated by Mr. Bonesteel in his review letter, a residential subdivision on its own, i.e. without a Windsor Drive connection, does not meet the threshold of requiring an EIS under Seeker, but given the additional potential trips in Windsor Drive with a Windsor Drive connection to River Road, quote, in accordance with Seeker guidance, this is a significant traffic impact that would necessitate a positive declaration under seeker and preparation of an environmental impact statement of the Windsor Drive connection if the Windsor Drive connection is included, unquote. Accordingly, the town board and the applicant have two alternative paths available to follow at this stage. Either one, pursue a project <clears throat> that complies with the town planning board's advisory recommendation, which will necessitate a positive declaration under seeker and preparation of an environmental impact statement as set forth in Mr. Bonesteel's review letter, or two, pursue a project consistent with the plan attached here to as exhibit A, which only includes a multi-use slash bike path. The plan attached here to as exhibit A has the support of the Windsor Drive group and will not result in traffic impacts that would require preparation of an environmental impact statement. For the foregoing reasons, the 40 households comprising the Windsor Drive Group request that the town board and the applicant pursue a proposal for this project that includes only a multi-use slash bike path, and that does not include either an emergency only gate or a full access Windsor Drive connection to River Road. In addition, the Windsor Drive Group requests that the town board impose an express condition of approval on the special use permit that requires that the connection from Windsor Drive be limited to a multi-use bike path only. And that was very sincerely submitted by Mr. Tingley. Okay. <clears throat> we have our next uh, letter. It is submitted by Sonia and Raj Shetty. They write, Dear Ms. Syed and town board members, thank you for the opportunity to express our concerns on the topic of the Windsor Drive cut through to River Road. As we have repeatedly stated in our letters to the planning board, the cut through will cause a significant increase in traffic, noise, and air pollution and make it unsafe for our kids and adults alike. We are already experiencing some scary situations, which we notice, for example, when backing out of our driveway or crossing the streets. We can only imagine what it will be like if the cut through is approved. 
The cut through will provide a direct connection between two major arteries in the local area, Belltown Road and River Road, and completely change the character of our neighborhood. <clears throat> we expect to see a significant reduction in our property value, as also evident from the recent neighborhood assessment presented at one of the planning board meetings. In all of our meetings thus far, we have not seen any real justification by the planning board for this cut through. We kindly request that the town board take our concerns seriously and do the right thing for the current and future residents of our neighborhood. That concludes that letter. Okay. And the next letter is submitted by Christopher and Victoria Hootner, and they write, Dear Supervisor Syed and members of the town board, we, Christopher and Victoria, are your neighbors at 4041 Windsor Drive. We are writing to you today to express our opposition to the current proposal at Kelts Farm that introduces a road connection between Windsor Drive and River Road. This road connection will have a direct negative impact on the street that we love and call home. All incomplete traffic study an incomplete traffic study already indicates that this will, at the minimum, increase traffic on our streets by about 1,000 cars per day. We believe this is an underestimation. Even this anticipated increase in traffic volume will make crossing the street for bikers and walkers who enjoy our multi-use path increasingly dangerous and difficult. This will increase noise and vehicle emissions on our street. This will change the character of our community. As residents of Windsor Drive, we already have the burden of high traffic during peak hours. As the parents of small children, we have personally witnessed dangerous drivers and our school bus being passed multiple times while it was stopped with the lights on. We do not need a road connection to make this worse. While we know that we will have the opportunity to speak with you at a public hearing regarding this proposal, we wanted to bring our concerns to your attention today. We understand and are ready to welcome our new neighbors at the Kelts Farm property, but the concerns and safety of the current neighborhood need to take priority. We support an alternative that allows Mr. Bazoin to develop his property, but with the only connection being a multi-use path. This will allow connectivity without sacrificing safety and sense of community. And that concludes that message. Okay. <clears throat> and our next privilege of the floor letter was submitted by Pallavi Dada and Pallavi Wrights. Dear Supervisor Syed and Nisuna Town Board members, my name is Pallavi Dada and I'm 15 years old. I'm a rising sophomore at Nisuna High School and my family moved to Windsor Drive when I was in fourth grade. I've done so much on the street, played with my friends, walked to school, and biked all around the neighborhood over the summers. On any given day, you can see runners, bikers, people walking dogs, neighbors admiring each other's tulips, and little kids selling lemonade. I'm writing this email because all of that is being threatened by the possibility of the Windsor Drive extension. I've grown up in this neighborhood and that's why it's hard for me to even imagine my quiet little street as a busy main road. <clears throat> Recently, my dinner table discussions have been overtaken with talks about zonal densities and I have found my parents annotating documents and poring over comprehensive plans. Along with the COVID-19 crisis, weekly Zoom meetings, constant emailing, and phone conversations, part of the effort to stop this connection have become our new normal. When we run into neighbors on walks, we'll discuss safety concerns, concerns about traffic instead of asking about the weather or school. While I can't speak about most of these topics, I can say a few things. As with many decisions, this one has a far-reaching impact on my generation, and it's often difficult to make our voices heard. For one, the serenity of our neighborhood will be drastically altered forever. Speeding has already been a serious problem and opening the street will considerably worsen it. I've never had to worry about my safety on the street, whether it was walking, playing outside or crossing the street with the influx of another thousand or so cars every day. I think it is safe to say this will no longer be the case. Another aspect of the problem, which I've not heard addressed yet is the impact it will have on the environment. When we moved into our house, the last of Windsor Drive, a dense thicket of trees in our backyard obscured, obscured River Road. Since then, nearly all of those trees have been cut down and River Road is clearly visible. For a few weeks in May, the Celts Farm area turned shades of purple and pink with the blooming lupines. 
Deer, birds, and bunnies are among the many wildlife that we see every day that will be stripped of their habitat should this development and extension continue. We celebrate Earth Day and discuss these bigger world problems of habitat loss, deforestation, and climate change. But taking the small steps that we can as a community to address them starts literally in our backyards. Why well, I say all of this, I say it with the understanding that the place where I live is also once a habitat for wildlife. Though we can't change the past, we can take steps to prevent future harm to wildlife. If stopping the development is not, not a possibility, then at least we can stop the connection and make only a bike path. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions and noise, therefore hopefully preserving some of the wildlife in the area. As far as I understand, the town board's job is to serve residents and ensure that our town remains the safe and peaceful community that it is. I hope you'll empathize with our concerns and hear our opposition for this project. The Windsor Drive community remains committed and passionate about this cause. And that concludes that letter. Next letter. This is submitted by Kevin Duffy of 1508 Keys Avenue. Kevin Wright, Supervisor Side and Town Board members. I have been watching with interest as the Town Board and Supervisor have deliberated how to handle improper behavior by political appointees. While the Comptroller's Halloween costume was certainly inappropriate under any circumstance, I find it particularly disturbing that a vote is scheduled to launch an investigation into a now retired former comptroller while we leave the litany, litany of misbehavior by Deputy Supervisor Stan Paminski uninvestigated. According to police records filed in the United States District Court for the Northern District of New York and the sworn depositions of other officers, including three former chiefs and a former deputy chief, Paminski is credibly alleged to have assaulted his then wife and in the midst of divorce proceedings, pushing her to the floor while screaming her to shut the expletive up. The sworn depositions of numerous former police officers, including a former chief, a former deputy chief, and a current lieutenant recall Feminsky's bullying behavior towards junior officers while on the force. The current lieutenant remembered Feminsky bullying at least three officers and said that Feminsky's modus operandi was to belittle and be unmerciful towards his victims while allowing the other officers to be unmerciful to that officer. One patrolman alleges that Feminsky was bullied, that Feminsky bullied him to the point of a nervous breakdown, including through routine threats of severe physical violence. This was found to be credible enough by a Prairie Town Board to warrant a disability adjudication, which has since cost Niskina taxpayers upwards of $2 million. According to the sworn deposition of former Niskina Police Chief Mark Salahab, Feminsky was investigated for helping falsify the timesheets in his then capacity as a sergeant of a subordinate with whom he has he was widely believed within the department to be having a sexual relationship. According to public federal court records, Feminsky pled guilty to multiple misconduct charges for misusing tens of thousands of dollars of town property and belittling town employees. Everyone in town knows the allegations against Feminsky. Some have been aware for years now, but everyone lost plausible deniability last fall when the details became widely known. Launching an investigation into a retired comptroller while ignoring the flagrant misbehavior of a second highest official in town is unforgivable. While the supervisor has consistently chosen to stand by Feminsky, denying simple facts like his guilty pleas in a blundered election eve press conference, and going as far to thank him in her second inaugural speech this January, the board has never tolerated his misbehavior and had nothing to do with his appoint appointment as deputy supervisor in the first place. I call upon the board to continue to show leadership and demonstrate that it has no tolerance for domestic violence, workplace bullying, police misconduct, abuse of power, or sexual misconduct, or retaining outside counsel for an immediate investigation into Stan Kaminsky. I ask that this comment be submitted into the record by the town clerk and have attached a summary of the allegations against Kaminsky with citations for the record. And that concludes that letter. And our next letter submitted by Rabbi Matthew Cutler. Rabbi Cutler writes, Dear Town Supervisor, I wrote to you because I cannot attend tonight's town board meeting. I want to express my support for the proposal to create a committee on racial equity. It is time for us to address this through a positive structure with our town government. 
Note that it is ratified, receives support, and establishes credibility to address some challenging issues. The protests of the latest last few weeks that surrounded the murder of George Floyd has focused on the incredible social injustices people of color face as citizens in this country and indeed in our own community. George Floyd's death was not an isolated, and isolated situation. Discrimination and bigotry are played out in our society on different levels. Some we are unconsciously and unwittingly a part of promoting. Reread Langston Hughes works and you will hear the anger of the pain which has been a part of black Americans experiences for generations. Listen to the voices of teenagers and young adults of color outside of town hall. These voices speak of ongoing systemic racism that must be acknowledged, addressed and rectified. To be silent now is to give acquiescence to bigotry and that is something none of us should ever tolerate. Our school district has started a process to explore the depths of these issues and challenges. I urge the town to do the same. During a recent discussion on Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, it is evident that the white community needs to take a three-step process to face these challenges. Acknowledge that there is a problem caused by a white supremacy, and if that is too harsh a term, then a white-dominated culture that has been in place in this country through introspection as a result of listening and learning, and that, that white people have been benefited from an unearned advantage because of the skin color. Resolve with concrete steps to address, it, to address these intangible and concrete man manners. This is not a lineal process, it is a continual one. It is essential that each of us seek to change ourselves. This is what this committee should be seeking to do. Listen to the stories and incidents, gather the data, on who we are and how often incidents of racism do occur, look at practices and policies with a critical eye as the committee seeks to make significant impact recommendations that will make this a place we can call home with pride. That concludes that letter. And I believe that is the last one. Let me just check here. Okay. That is the last public comment. So that concludes our privilege of the floor section. Would anyone like to take a break or is everybody ready to uh, proceed through their committee reports? Okay. Actually, Supervisor. Yes. I'd like to make a motion um, to, according to public officer's law, article seven, section 105F, that the town board move into executive session concerning a medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person. Okay, so we have a motion subject to public officer's law, section 105, subsection F. The motion is mid me. Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second. Okay, all those in favor, signified by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so I'm going to assume that the only members patching into executive session are town board, town attorney, and deputy town attorney. Are there any other members that need to be present otherwise? I don't believe so. Okay, excellent. So we are now going to uh, town board members and town attorney and deputy town attorney are going to call into a separate line. And at the conclusion of executive session, if we have taken any action, we will describe the action that has been taken and we will move right back into committee reports followed by supervisor's report and then resolutions. So at this time, we're going to take a pause and we're all gonna dial into an outside line. 